adopted uh, tiny autonomous drones and neuromorphic AI to uh, make them fly by themselves. A and uh, most people, when they think about autonomous drones, they uh, think about the kind of drone that you will see taking off right now. It's a quad rotor, so it has four propellers. And this drone is flying by itself and doing an autonomous drone race. It's actually the world championship that happened in 2019. And this was our drone that actually got the fastest time, uh, winning us quite a nice uh, money prize uh, at that. But in our lab, we work also really on very different types of drones. Uh, and uh, the drone that you see flying into the screen right now, uh, oh yeah, it, uh, we have to wait a little bit because it's like slow motion. Yeah, but here it is. Uh, so uh, it's the Delphi. It's a flapping wing drone uh, that uh, flies by flapping the wings. And it's very agile, so we were even able to mimic escape maneuvers of fruit flies. Uh, and uh, yeah, try to swat one. They're very fast, they evade your hand. And the special thing about our design was that uh, it could uh, steer by changing the dynamics of the wings, and that's why it was so fast. And it even provided us with some new insights into how fruit flies make these maneuvers. Now, when you talk about autonomy of drones, then you, uh, the most important topic is size, weight, and power. Uh, because uh, yeah, all robots are limited in what they can take on board. But if you think of drones, they have to lift everything into the air. So the computing, the sensing, and they have to, to be really autonomous, uh, do all the processing on board. Now, if you look at the drone that uh, the organizers made for the drone race, it's a pretty big drone. So uh, it's like uh, roughly three kilos. It uses uh, roughly 600 watts to fly, so that's quite some energy. But it has a really nice computing unit. That's also why it became so big, uh, the NVIDIA Jetson Xavier. If you look at the Delphi, it's uh, a very different kind of vehicle. So it's 29 grams and it uses 6 watts to fly, uh, so that's much less. And typically what we have on board is a little microcontroller, an STM32F4, which has 168 megahertz processor and 192 kilobytes of memory. So that is extremely little compared to the 42 gigabytes here. Uh, of course, I'm old enough to still have played with the Commodore 64, so I'm thinking, hey, that's three times as much, right? But uh, <laughs> anyway, so how can we make this thing that is 100 times lighter, how can we make it still autonomous? Is that, uh, is that possible? Now, one thing that roboticists typically do is they, for navigation, they use uh, simultaneous localization and mapping, and they base that on... Uh, yeah, making a map of the environment. Uh, and if you talk about visual slam, then typically this means you have a camera and you build a 3D map uh, with which is highly detailed and takes hundreds to thousands of megabytes, even for relatively modest spaces. Now you can see that uh, we have 192 kilobytes, so we're not able to support this kind of uh, very accurate and nice uh, algorithm. The other avenue to intelligence is to use deep nets. And this is also something that's a bit problematic for us because if you look at an embedded unit, the NVIDIA Jetson TX2 here, so it's a little bit older, uh, but uh, it weighs 85 grams and takes seven and a half watts. As you can see, it's three times as heavy roughly as the Delphi. So basically it cannot carry it. Uh, but also I think the power budget, yeah, if you use more energy to think than to fly, yeah, that, that ain't gonna fly basically. So that's a bit depressing, right? So we have the two main approaches. We cannot use them. So what do we do? Uh, is it possible, actually, to make these tiny autonomous drones? And I think that uh, you will realize that this is possible. Uh, because uh, if you look around you, especially in the summer, you see all these flying insects. So I get annoyed also by these fruit flies in my kitchen, but uh, OK. They're also marvelous creatures, right? So this is a honeybee. Uh, it's able to uh, land on a flower moving in the wind. It uh, constructs its own base station, and it does that uh, together with others. Uh, it can navigate over tens of kilometers and come back home. I think that's really fantastic. It's something we lack. Uh, they also communicate together. So if they find a very nice flower field, get back into the nest, uh, the hive. And I think the very cool thing is, so in the hive it's dark, and they, they do this dance. Uh, so they communicate via dance. Uh, yes, nice. And uh, so they wiggle. And uh, the very cool thing is, so it's uh, like a code language, but in the hive they have the direction of gravity. And the angle of the dance with respect to gravity 
is information on the angle that the other bee should follow with respect to the sun. And so, yeah, I think it's very cool that they do that. Uh, so they work together. Oh, that's the wrong direction. They also take group decisions, yeah, so swarm decisions. Like if, they, if there's a new queen, then the old queen has to move out. Yeah, so with my children, I hope it's going to go the other way around. But, you know, for the bees, so the old queen has to move out. <laughs> and, um, so and then they send scouts, and they find these uh, different locations, and they look, uh, how good is this location? And then they will advertise it with the waggle dance. And, uh, but sometimes they also disagree. There may be two places that are very similar, and then you have bees advertising these two places. And uh, in an artificial system, this could lead to a deadlock. But what do honeybees do? If they're very enthusiastic about place A and they see a honeybee advertising place B, then they give that bee headbutts. So they're giving headbutts to disturb the dance. And then uh, scientists prove that it always collapses to one choice. And so that's really, I think, fantastic as well. And uh, they can recognize complex visual patterns. Uh, and uh, all of this with only one million neurons. Uh, and I think that's amazing. Uh, just to put it in pers perspective, we have 86 billion neurons in our brains. And so, yeah, really amazing. And I just want to know how they do that. Uh, and uh, yeah, um, if you think about it, so I've been working a lot on insect-inspired artificial intelligence. Uh, I think it's AI, I think they are intelligent. <laughs> Uh, and this is a definition by Luke Steels of AI. It's the pursuit of intelligent behavior by artificial methods. I think that uh, also applies if you uh, think of the intelligence of insects. Uh, and uh, on the one hand, I think that this can really bring capabilities for our robots that we don't have yet, uh, for flying robots, for example. Um, but I also think that uh, studying these uh, robots can give us actually a lot of insights into insect intelligence. And one example is a study we had in Nature a few years back where we showed how insects, but also drones, can estimate uh, the direction of gravity without accelerometers. Uh, because insects do not have that sense. Uh, they don't have the sense of acceleration. And, um, and I think as well that yeah, if we learn about insect intelligence, these creatures, yeah, like I tried to explain, uh, they're fully intelligent creatures. Of course, more limited than we are, admittedly. Although I cannot fly, by the way, but okay. Uh, but uh, it's a very nice model system to learn about intelligence in general. Okay, so one of the key properties of insect intelligence is that it's parsimonious. So it's very efficient and robust. And uh, this is in multiple aspects. Uh, so let's see if this works. Yeah, it's in the body, for example, the embodiment. So we see a flapping wing there. It's flying in a greenhouse, and it's one of the coolest demos I ever saw. It's a flapper drone, it's a spin-off from our lab. And as you see, it's flying into the wires and the plants, but it doesn't fall and it just flies away in the end. And this is thanks to its soft body. Eh? And if you do this with a quad rotor, it will yeah, just catch uh, with the propellers one of the wires and fall. Eh? But this uh, flapper drone can just continue. So actually, this allows it to be less intelligent, eh? less accurate about obstacle avoidance. Uh, like I said, insects work together, but we can also exploit it for robots. The, so this swarm of drones is exploring an unknown space, and uh, they have gas sensors. So this one is now smelling gas. And then they use a particle swarm optimization, where the robots are the particles, to find the gas source. All of this with only onboard resources. And finally, uh, animals and uh, insects as well use sensory motor coordination. So the drone you see, it uses optical flow for obstacle detection, but it moves on purpose up and down to induce uh, translational flow, uh, which makes its ta task very much easier. And so the use of actions, swarming, embodiment, it all contributes to the efficiency of this type of intelligence. And although we don't like to admit, we actually do the same things as humans as well. Okay. So when you see this work, we're actually using the STM. Uh, and uh, the STM is very nice because uh, uh, the, the video I show here is about uh, the exploration of unknown environments with a swarm of tiny drones. And what they do is actually they have this little finite state machine that you see on the right of the slide. And uh, they uh, have very simple behaviors like uh, move forward, follow wall, move away, rotate to the desired direction. And just by alternating and switching between these very simple behaviors, 
they can perform a task that's super complex. And uh, so this is, I think, very interesting. Uh, but uh, uh, from experience, the, oh, the limitation of this approach lies in the processing of high dimensional uh, sensory data. Uh, because then a microcontroller is not super suited. Uh, you need parallel processing of high dimensional data. And that's why we've been investing a lot of time in uh, neuromorphic sensing and processing. So what is that? So I think most of you actually know, but okay, let me introduce a little bit. So on the uh, neuromorphic sensing and processing mimics animal sparse and asynchronous sensing and processing. And because of this, it's extremely energy efficient and fast. Now to illustrate, we have images here from a normal camera on the left that uh, at 30 hertz, and it's filming a spinning propeller. Uh, and uh, when we slow the images down, you see that yeah, it sometimes doesn't even see the propeller because it's so extremely blurry. On the right, I show a neuromorphic camera. And these cameras don't make images, but each pixel looks, am I becoming da darker or brighter? And when that happens, then they send a signal. So darker is the red pixels over there, and brighter is the green pixels. And as you can see, it can perfectly follow the propeller over time. And so these events can be a microsecond apart, so they can see very quick motion, actually. Now, these inputs, they fit very well with a new kind of uh, processor, a neuromorphic processor, in which you can implement spiking neural networks that mimic the property of neurons in our brain that most information is sent via pulses, via yeah, more or less binary pulses, actually, over time. And because of this, these can also be much more efficient than normal processors. So let me illustrate that with this figure. So on the top, there's a traditional ANN that you would run in a GPU. And on the bottom, there's a spiking neural network. So the traditional ANN has synchronous transmission. So you have all the inputs and then the whole first layer, second layer, et cetera. And actually you do that in one time step. But in a neuromorphic processor, this information transmission is asynchronous. Something happens somewhere in your visual field, uh, this uh, event, and then it gets propagated from that neuron to the next neuron. And the others don't do anything. So if there's no information to be sent, nothing happens. Uh, so that's very different. This is quicker. On top, you have floating point values that are continuous and differentiable. Uh, so, uh, and on the bottom, you have purely discrete uh, spikes, so binary, uh, and it's not differentiable. And this means, this is, it goes into the discussion that was here earlier today. And so it's of course easier with the floating points to represent a lot of information. And the learning is easier. Uh, we all know backprop. Uh, so that's much easier uh, with the network on top. And that's why the accuracy of these networks is still better uh, than uh, the spiking nets. Now, and finally, you have uh, dense multiplications and additions on the top. So all neurons are active. And on the bottom, you have sparse additions. And to illustrate why uh, the bottom uh, option of spiking neural network is going to be uh, faster and more energy efficient, I'm going to involve you as an audience into a very immers immersive, interactive uh, part of this talk. And so I'm going to ask you a question. Uh, it's, a, it's a calculation. And uh, if you have the answer, please raise your hand. Yeah, so are you ready? Yeah, you're all pumped, I hear that, yeah, great. No, no computers. So what is 6.43 times 3.22 plus 7.88 times 1.26? Anyone? I read, okay, <laughs> tell us. 30? 38? Uh, it's pretty, yeah, it's pretty quick, accurate, but I also want the digits after the... <laughs> Okay, this can take a while. I don't know, how, how are we on time, uh, Giacomo? <laughs> okay, I'm gonna give the answer. Very good, very, very close already. 30.6334, and indeed I used the calculator for this. Um, okay, you're warmed up, and now I will give you the kind of calculation that the spiking net needs to do. Are you ready? Uh, so raise your hand. Eh? So how much is eight plus 12? <laughs> okay, very good. <laughs> You're all very smart. <laughs> I, I hope now this the answer on the slide is correct as well, because uh, I think it's correct, right? Yeah. So that's much quicker, of course. <laughs> yeah, I didn't use the calculator for this. <laughs> no. Anyway, so 
And you can see that also for us humans, it's of course easier to do these kind of calculations, but also in electronics, this is the case. So what is the state of SNN uh, at the moment? Uh, so uh, we can do backpropagation now, so uh, with surrogate backpropagation, where they actually pretend that the spike function uh, is a smooth one that they differentiate. Uh, so uh, that works quite well. Uh, and the training is still harder though, because uh, each neuron in a spiking network is like a little dynamical system. Uh, and this is much harder to, to train, basically. Uh, the accuracy on most tasks is less, uh, also because the information is binary, so yeah, uh, and the training is harder, but uh, it's faster and more energy efficient. Uh, so that's yeah, the state of the art right now. As roboticists, we also wonder, like we heard earlier today a talk uh, also mentioning the Intel OE, and I will still show to you also in my presentation. Uh, so we have this more difficult training, but we also have quite immature hardware. Uh, so the event-based sensors now are quite available, although still expensive, like was mentioned uh, earlier as well. Uh, but the processors are very hard to get, difficult to use, little documentation. Yeah, it's almost still a research uh, prototype, basically. So. Um, and, and these uh, chips have very limited network sizes. So, um, in the interest of time, I wanted to spare you the whole uh, journey that I made, or like Odyssey, for the past eight years, because it was my dream to make uh, a fully neuromorphic vision and control for autonomous drone, autonomously flying drone. And uh, we did many steps, and uh, we stumbled a lot of times and fell, and then we got up again. And uh, last year we actually succeeded, uh, yeah, this, this thing, um, on a drone. So what does it look like? We have an event-based camera, and then we have uh, this sensory data going into the Intel OE chip, as a neuromorphic processor. And there's one spiking neural network that then goes to low-level commands uh, for the autonomous drone. Uh, and what is it doing? So it's doing ego motion control. That's one of the first things that, uh, yeah, as an animal or robot, you would like to do is to move to where you want to move. And um, it's doing that on the basis of vision. So let's look into the brain for a second. So on the left, you see these uh, red and green pixels. You remember them from the event cam. So we have a drone that looks down. It looks at the floor and it's looking like, okay, if you move like this, then the ground seems to pass by like that, right? So that's the kind of thing that it's uh, trying to interpret. And then it goes into the spiking net, and you see these white pixels are spiking neurons. And then it goes here to the next layer, next layer, next layer, and get that goes into the control. Uh, so, uh, yeah, it's quite challenging to make a single spiking net to do that. And I want to, you know, yeah, um, talk a little bit about how we did it at a higher abstraction level. Uh, so, how do you train it, right? So, and I think that one thing people may think about is, let's do end-to-end -end reinforcement learning. Now, of course, this is a great topic and thing to do, but in this case, it's a bit hard because uh, event-based sensors, cameras, are hard to simulate. Actually, they simulate them by making many, 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 many images. Uh, and if you already have a pretty sample inefficient reinforcement learning where you need thousands of runs to learn ego motion control with vision, this becomes much worse if you need to, you know, uh, simulate vision at a thousand hertz in simulation. And so this, this is uh, much too time staking to do. So we took a different path. And the path we took is to split vision and control. Uh, and uh, so how did we did do that? We first used self-supervised learning to take the vision inputs. Uh, so if we're looking at this beautiful carpet, then we get these event inputs. And then we have one spiking net trained in a self-supervised way to output uh, the optical flow uh, that's in uh, these events. And, and then we have another network, another spiking net. We have a simulator, we have the drone there. If we know the drone motion, which we do in the simulator, then we can predict what the, the ego motion and the optical flow will be. Uh, so we can basically model what would come out of the first network if it works well. And we enter that flow into the second spiking net that uh, learns with evolutionary learning, so evolutionary robotics, how to fly. Now, and then uh, there's two things. So one thing I will present is on how the self-supervised learning works. 
but we also need to merge these spiking nets. That was another challenge. So the self-supervised learning looks like this. Um, if you have your camera and you move it and you accumulate the events over time, you get this kind of blurry output on the top. If you know the optical flow perfectly, then you can take each event and drag it back to where it came from. Yes, so if you do optical flow well, you can get this really sharp, de-blurred event uh, window. Uh, and uh, in the beginning, this network doesn't work so well yet, yes, so it makes mistakes. This is not as de-blurred as you would like, but then you can do backpropagation to uh, teach your network to uh, actually de-blur better and better over time, and at the end it's able to do optical flow. And it does so without any ground truth. Yes, so you don't need ground truth, but we also don't have a reality gap, because we take the camera from our drone, we fly it, and then it learns optical flow, and uh, that's it. This is what the hardware setup looks like. So we have a drone here, we have the event camera and the Loihi. Unfortunately, we could not connect them directly to each other, and we needed to use an upboard just for communication. And so the drone is still pretty big. And so we're now working, you know, on smaller prototypes. And uh, I want to show you a video, so I'm only going to show one. I hope it starts automatically. Yeah. And this is the landing experiments, but it's controlling all its axes. You see the events here and the spikes. And you see that it's doing a landing, and we call it a uh, constant divergence landing. It's what honeybees do to land. And here we're playing with it. It never saw this in training, like uh, flickering the light works. In the dark, also works. Yeah, so when it's quite dark, uh, the event cam has a much higher dynamic range. It still works. If you make it really dark, it crashes. Yeah, so, uh <laughs> so that didn't work. <laughs> but that's the same. Yeah, if uh, yeah, with touch. But uh, yeah, if you fall, then uh, yeah, touch is not enough. Yeah, I mean, you feel that you crashed. <laughs> yeah, so um, anyway. So very important. Can we now actually see these advantages that people promise about neuromorphic? Right. So this is a big table, but I, sh I make it simpler. <laughs> yeah, so on top we have the Loihi. And we see that for inference of the network, it uses 7 milliwatts. And on the bottom is a uh, Jetson Nano, and it uses 1.9 watts. The Nano runs at 25 hertz, and the Loihi runs at 274 hertz. This really depends on the sequence. So if there's a lot of events, it's 274 hertz. If it's moving slower or there's less texture, it's running at 1600 hertz. Yes, so, yeah, very fast. Yes, so, yes. Energy efficient, yes, very fast. Um, I don't know if I made it much too short. Normally I'm much too long, but... Uh okay, good, then we have more time for questions. So, <laughs> yeah, so uh, the conclusion, I think that neuromorphic sensing and processing is very promising for tiny drones, but I also think for bigger robots in the end, because in the end you want to do many tasks uh, with uh, humanoid robots as well, and then it's still processing has to be efficient. Um, in the future, we want to improve the learning mechanism, so we're very actively working on online learning, so learning while the drone is flying, and uh, we're working on increasingly complex tasks. So one thing I really want to tackle is vision-based navigation. And so these honeybees that fly kilometers and come back, I want to do the same with our drones. And uh, with that, I want to thank oh yeah, the team behind the Neuromorphic. Uh, it was a pretty big team. And uh, all the other people, <laughs> non-exhaustive list of other people that worked on the other studies that I showed. So I thank you for your attention and uh, gladly to take questions.